about shortness of breath. Please leave the building now. I'm afraid we're coming back until you're feeling better. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask for call, uh, roll call, please, to the clerk. Commissioner Mercer? Here. Commissioner Gates? Here. Commissioner Powell? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Birdsong? Here. Mayor Gates? Here. I'm going to ask my fellow commissioners, please try to speak into the microphone so everybody can hear. Record Thank video. Much. Okay. Um, got some comments from the audience. The city manager, we decided to do that at the end, or who did you think I should do that? I know we... Yeah, I think we probably go ahead and address it now. Okay. This is a public meeting, and we've got two people that have emailed in with some public questions and some comments, so I'm going to go ahead and read those now. First was dated 4-6 of 20. This is from George Jones, 4884 Mandolin Court, Winterhaven, Florida. Question number one. Is the city winner even formally encouraging or formally mandating members of the public to wear cloth, fabric, and face masks when out of the public and shopping at essential businesses such as pharmacies, groceries, fast food restaurants, etc., etc.? I guess I'll call the city attorney to answer that question. I believe that we did, uh, Chief Bird responded to that email or something with his office, but my understanding is that. Uh, we are encouraging uh, people to wear face masks uh, out in public, both in accordance with guidance from the CDC and the Department of Health. Uh, I don't know if we mandate anyone to do that, but we are certainly encouraging uh, people to do that. City Manager has his hand up. The uh, Mayor of City Commissioners, the, uh, on our, our city website, uh, we have a message from the city of Winter Haven. Uh, we have uh, designed this in a way of frequently asked questions. Uh, I've shared this information with you. This was prepared by uh, Don Sheehan, assistant to the city manager. The, uh, this is also going to be a, well here in our utility bills as a bill stuffer. Uh, and so uh, the point that we raised, or the decision we raised, wear a face mask. Wear a face mask if you're sick or if you're not. Uh, and so we are encouraging people to do so along with self isolation uh, and, of course, to. Uh, Stay away from, from others if you uh, have been infected. So the answer is yes. Okay, so Mr. Jones, question to answer number one is yes, we are formally encouraging um, this uh, face pass. Question number two is the city of Winter Haven formally encouraging or formally mandating employees of essential businesses to wear gloss, fabric, masks, when serving or working at essential businesses such as pharmacies, groceries, fast food restaurants, etc., etc. Well, the uh, guidelines from the from the Center for Disease Control, uh, and in watching the uh, news conferences over the weekend that were conducted uh, by the uh, President of the United States and other members of his uh, uh, team, the uh, masks are voluntary, they're not mandatory, uh, but they're highly suggested. And so I think the answer would be yes. Uh, we're encouraging businesses to do so, individuals to do so, relatively certain chamber has put that out in their messages to the chamber members. Uh, and so we would we would say pay attention to the, the uh, Center for Disease Control wear masks. Thank you. I think that would be considered formally encouraging, so that's good. Third question: What does the Winter Haven Public Safety Director do to make Winter Haven residents safer from this COVID-19 crisis? Chief, is that you? Or the uh, mayor? Is that the uh, last question? Yes, that's the last question in the email. All right. Then I think it's appropriate to uh, turn to. Uh, Public Safety Director Bird. Uh, the uh, first item uh, under presentation this evening is to give an update uh, with respect to COVID-19 strategies that we have put into place uh, and to, uh, along with that, uh, the City Attorney will be giving you an overview of the Governor's Executive Order 20-91. The uh, Public Safety Director uh, Bird will be talking about our enforcement strategies with respect to the uh, complying with the executive order 20-91, and he will address Mr. Jones's question as well. Uh, I'll yield the public safety director. And Chief, please come forward. Before you do, I've got one other email that I want to read to get these both on the record. This is from Allen and Carmen P. This is more of a compliment than it is a question. It was addressed to all the commissioners. Went on to talk about how uh, they are natives of Central Florida and how they were very pleased and proud to support the businesses who remain open throughout all this unusual time of their lives. Uh, they also were talking about how they observed fellow voters, these are voters, that they were observing fellow voters on the chain of lakes as they waved to people and uh, they, they 
center of the crowd. I want to interact with fellow voters through a distant wave or smile to the service industry personnel and various members of law enforcement in Polk County, Bob Florida Wildlife, et cetera, et cetera. These, it was these observations that either further bolstered my pride in being a member of the voting community and one who frequents our winter game chain of lakes. I respectfully request you to consider this as this as you deliberate the topic of our public programs. Thank you for serving as you do, and a many good vibes to you and your families. Okay, Chief. Honorable Mayor and City Commissioners, uh, uh, what I'd like to do, is, what I was going to do, is before I get into the, the meat of what, what I'm going to present to you, I wanted the uh, Deputy Fire Chief to uh, give you an update on the COVID uh, numbers and everything, most recent thing with the cats. Thank you. Commissioners, Mayor. Kern of Polk County has 172 positive, 157 positive cases as of 11 o'clock today. Mm -hmm. State of Florida is 13,324. Death rate in Florida is at 236. Our local death rate in Polk County is four at this point in time from COVID 19 virus. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Judge, the answer to Mr. Jones' question is pretty voluminous. Uh, I'm going to go through my presentation because I'll answer some of those things, and then I'll hit on some other uh, as far as what we're doing to try to keep the folks safe. Uh, first and foremost, one of the things that we're concentrating on is making sure that our work workforce is safe and um, protected against uh, being exposed, dealing with the exposures to minimize or mitigate those exposures, uh, and then also if, it's, um, if there's an exposure to get them isolated as quickly as possible so that we don't uh, contaminate other employees. Uh, one of the first things for public safety that we have to do in order to be able to provide public safety is to provide the employees that can do that public safety. And if they're sick and we lose a great deal of, uh, due to uh, having to self-quarantine or isolate, uh, then we don't have the workforce to be able to go out and provide public safety. So that's the number one thing that we're trying to do to provide public safety. Um, the Department of Public Safety team has so far done an exceptional job with the current COVID crisis. Your first responders will continue to answer all of the calls for service, provide medical treatment, fight crime, educate, and correct anyone that may be in violation of any of the emergency orders issued by Governor DeSantis today. As I'm sure you're aware, there have been quite a few questions dealing with Executive Order 20-91, which was issued April 1st and went into effect last Friday, April 3rd. This emergency order will remain in effect until April 30th at a minimum, and as previously stated, in violation of emergency order is also a violation of Florida State statute, which is a second degree misdemeanor uh, and can be punishable under Florida State Statute 775.82. 7753, which is up to a $500 fine and, and prison imprisonment not to exceed 60 days. So what does enforcement look like? Enforcement looks like um, these are the protocols that we're doing for the enforcement. We've identified the most likely violations that we will expect to see as being uh, non-essential businesses being in operation when they shouldn't be. People gathered in public places in numbers greater than 10 people gathering in private residence in numbers greater than 10. Uh, we've actually had a few calls for that as, as some uh, other local jurisdictions. So our procedure, how are we going to approach that? How are we going to uh, go about enforcing this? Well, the number one goal is to educate the potential violator. What we want to do is bring them into compliance uh, themselves. Sometimes they, uh, I hate to say that, that somebody doesn't know, especially if they're paying attention and knows what's going on, they should know. What we want to do is educate them and make sure that they understand uh, what they're up against and what the dangers are for them violating that, that order. What we want to do is get to, uh, we want to bend over backwards to try to make sure that we have people um, that can, um, that will follow those orders as, as they're given. So one of the procedures that we put in place is the observer violation. This is to our officers. 
understand clearly what the violation is and provide them with a warning to bring them into compliance. At that point in time, we expect that they would, they would comply. If this is occurring on city property, we can consider, and they, and they refuse, we can consider a trespass as well. If the preferred person refused to disperse, then we would issue a trespass warning. If the person still refused to disperse, the subject may be arrested for trespassing, uh, citing uh, the Executive Order 20 91 as trespass. That's the Executive Order that would be a criminal case under the Florida State statute for violating uh, trespass after, uh, after being issued. Uh, business violations. We would seek out the person in charge of the business at that time and explain to the operation, explain the operation to their business is in violation of the emergency order. A prudence history, if we do this so that we can make sure that we have, whether we can identify a repeat offender or not, if it's somebody that's continually trying, it'll be entered into our CAD system under comments so that we can then pull that back up and, and, and refer to it so that we can say, okay, listen, this is your second offense. This is the second time you've done this. We've already warned you. We've already given you uh, the information that you need. We need you to come into compliance. We advise them that we'll be documenting that warning and the violation as well as the fact that they were provided with the warning will be reported. Businesses received prior warnings and found them may have violation the second time, issue the appropriate person a second documented warning, and then advise them further, viol further violations may result in a criminal charge, which is a second degree misdemeanor. Again, it's documented in our CAD system, and if we find them in, in violation the third time, and the third violation, especially if it's within 48 hours of the second violation, they will be criminally charged. Not arrested, they'll be charged for affidavit. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll comment on that in just a minute. Any notice to appear issued shall be forwarded to the Uniform Services Captain for review to make sure all the steps were handled and that the supervisor was there if possible. If the third violation was not within 48 hours of the second violation, then it will be documented a warning again to get the, the time the clock started again. Fourth violation occurs, uh, they'll be charged and possibly a physical arrest could, be take, could take place. Now understand something, that is our last, absolute last uh, uh, alternative that we want to get to. We want to get compliance. Uh, we're taking the same approach as the sheriff is and every other uh, jurisdiction in the county. Um, we want to do it. But as the sheriff pointed out in his uh, uh, address to the county commissioners on Friday, there is not enough room in the jail to put 600 and over 600,000 people that have been outside the violate. There's no room in the jail to put over 40,000 of Winter Haven's residents in there. There's just simply not room. The goal is to get compliance. But if you have someone that pushes the issue, that continues to be a problem, it's going to push it then we will, we will do what we have to do and take the action that we need to take. And that, that includes arrest and that will be it. The 911 call center who dispatches to Winter has protocols in place for first responders to try to screen the calls uh, for any signs or symptoms of COVID-19 in an effort to prepare a first responder for potential exposure prior to arriving at the scene. Cooperation is, is essential during this period of time. We need the public to cooperate. That's the message that we have to keep drilling out there and that we actually do. The public needs to police themselves. Again, we will work diligently to correct, to educate, but if we have someone that is going to continue to push the envelope and absolutely refuse those orders, then we will deal with them appropriately. In addition to that, generally speaking, if you get to that level, uh, there's generally some additional charges that may go with it. I say may. It all depends on how that, that uh, encounter goes. Uh, but 
uh, if it's, again, we want to push that we want self-compliance. We want people to comply with this. So to give you an update about the Department of Public Safety, some of the efforts that we've taken include continued monitoring of our employees prior to work and every 12 hours afterwards. It includes taking the temperature, it includes the visual signs, checking for cough, sneezing, shortness of breath, those types of things. If any of those markers are identified, <clears throat> excuse me, we have two captains, a captain, EMS captain at the fire department and a training captain who are both medics uh, who will come in and do an evaluation on the employee and if they then make the determination whether or not they need to go home or if they can stay if they meet the criteria. If, support, if an employee has to be isolated, they will continue to be monitored in that way so that the first time that the signs of COVID-19 or if those signs start coming up, they'll immediately be taken to a facility so that they can be uh, treated. One of the options that we've had too for our, our uh, first responders is trying to set up if any of them did not want to go home and risk the possibility of contaminating their loved one or family member. Um, we have a location uh, that we have um, that's city owned um, that uh, we will put them at if they want to voluntarily go there. It's a provision with uh, sleeping. Um, it's got shower, bathrooms, kitchen, everything that they need and it's uh, pretty isolated it's probably sits on two acres of land staffing the fire department's being divided so only one engine company can be staffed at station one uh, we're in the process of identifying two off-site locations 